Hello, hello. Okay. Boa tarde a todos e todas. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the penultimate lecture on black hole gastrophysics. Today we will continue and finish the, the a broad picture to form a broad picture of accretion disks, accretion flows around black holes, and then move on to outflows from, from black holes, and therefore have a global view of the ins and outs of black holes. As we, let's, let's we stopped yesterday, which was we had an overview of the conservation equations for the mass, the momentum, and the density in fluids, the equ conservation equations of hydrodynamics, the Newtonian conservation equations. And then we saw a very, uh, we, we, we saw a modified version of the energy conservation equation, which will be relevant to, to have a broad, unified view of accretion disks. So this is, as I was saying at yesterday, this is the energy conservation equation in a slightly different and more compact version where you have the, COVID, the Lagrangian derivative of the entropy of the fluid, which is equal, equal the heat generated in the fluid minus the cooling, the energy lost by any sort of cooling. Hmm. One second. Somebody has the, somebody retained the USB receiver here, Ian. Sasha, did you keep the receiver? No. Yeah. Okay. Gone with the wind. Right. Ah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. It was accreted back. Okay. No problem. Right, so this, 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 compact, this compact version of the energy conservation equation, uh, we can simply understand as a statement that the heat energy must go somewhere. Don't worry, it's not a big deal, okay? Don't worry. Stay cool, take it easy. <laughs> so the, 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 this equation really means that the heat energy generated by viscous dissipation, sorry, the key plus, it must go somewhere. So part of it goes into radiative cooling. Part of it is advected with the fluid. Okay. And then you understood what is advection by this simple example of the advection of a car by a fluid. So now we can proceed and have a very simple description of an accretion disk. Okay. The Navier-Stokes equation is very complicated, right? And we, as theorists, we are trying to simplify our view of the universe. Uh, as much as possible. So let's characterize an accretion disk by right now, of course, there is the mass of the black hole, the, 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 the gravity parameter, so the mass and the spin. Remember, charge is not relevant for astrophysics, and also the temperature of the black hole is not relevant. Hawking radiation is, as we learn, is irrelevant for astrophysics. So apart from the metric parameters, the first number that we will focus on is the mass accretion rate, characterized through the Addington rate, as we learned yesterday, the definition of the Addington luminosity and the Addington accretion rate. We can think of the Addington accretion rate as a limiting accretion rate, a sort of a scale that whenever this ratio here goes close to one, you are nearing trouble in your accretion physics because you're reaching the maximum limit with which you can feed the black hole. If you try to feed the black hole in principle, 
in a spherically symmetric way above a, a ratio of this ratio above one, then your black hole might start refusing further uh, um, accretion of material. So this is the first number. Uh, the accretion rate is really related to the density. Okay, we can we can work with the continuity equation. And we can find out that the, this value, this parameter here, the accretion rate is a conserved quantity of the fluid, of the accretion disk. So the accretion rate is really related to the density of the, of the fluid. So whenever we increase or decrease the accretion rate, we are increasing or decreasing the density of the gas, okay? And the, the second number that we will pay attention to, which is really, related to the global, global properties of the disk is the disk thickness, which is the radius to the radius, okay? So whenever the disk is thick, this ratio here will go up. If it, if it is very thin, this ratio will be much smaller than one because the thickness is much smaller than the radius of the, the radius where you are considering the disk. So now we are ready to try to have a global unified theory of a black hole accretion disks. So this axis show the ratio of the accretion rate to the Addington accretion rate. It is more or less the same thing as the ratio of the luminosity released by the accretion disk over the Addington luminosity, okay? So the first solution, the first regime of black hole accretion happens, occurs, for ratios, the Addington, for the accretion rate over Addington accretion rate between 1 and 0 0.01, in other words, 1%. Okay? So for, for, so for this, in these conditions, what happens is that you have high densities of the accretion disk. So the cooling time, the, the disk has a high density. The electrons which radiate, they are interacting strongly with the protons through Coulomb collisions. Okay, so the protons get the viscous, the viscous heat energy, and they transfer the, to the electrons via Coulomb collisions. If you have high densities, electrons are, the, the electrons get very rapidly the energy from the protons, and they radiate it away. So the cooling time is much smaller than the time it takes for a, for a portion of the disk to fall into the black hole. In other words, the disk will try to get rid as fast as possible of its heat energy. In other words, the, cool, the radiative cooling time term is much more important than the advection cooling term. In these conditions, what happens with the accretion disk is that the disk cools very rapidly. There is not a lot of uh, pressure to support the disk, so the disk collapses into a thin quasi-Keplerian disk, what we call thin disk with a, with a very small height, very, very thin disk, as we call, for this range of accretion rates. Now, if you start decreasing the accretion rate, the density also goes down. And because the density goes down, the interactions between electrons and protons, they, got, they, get, they start becoming rare. So the protons will get the heat energy from viscosity from turbulence, but the electrons will not receive that viscous energy by Coulomb collisions. All of this is related to the microphysics of the disk. That's why I'm talking about the microphysics. So when you decrease the accretion rate, you go down in this axis here, you decrease the density, the cooling time starts getting very big, and it, it, in fact, the cooling time gets bigger than the time it takes for the gas to be accreted by the black hole. In other words, the advective cooling uh, ratio, the, the, the advective cooling rate gets bigger than the radiative cooling rate. What happens now is that the heat energy will not be released by radiation. So the gas will store the heat energy, okay, and it will keep store heating energy, and it will inflate like a balloon. The accretion disk will inflate like a balloon, and it will reach a new vertical hydrostatic equilibrium configuration where it will be become very thick because of the high thermal pressure. And so the age over R will get big, will get close to one. And in this case, what happens here is that the disk, instead of releasing the heat energy as radiation, it stores the heat energy as ther thermal energy and gets very thick, like, almost like a balloon. 
and we call it a radiatively inefficient accretion flow because it's very a very inefficient radiator, this kind of accretion disks with low accretion rates. Now, if we keep decreasing, look, there is something interesting happening here. I'm showing you also this blue thing, which is really the jet from the black hole that I will talk. I will describe the physics of the jet in the next lecture. Okay, I will not talk right now about the physics of the jet. But look, so you, you can keep playing this game if you're feeding a black hole, if you have a nice black hole that you love and cherish in your home. If for, for some reason you don't like your black hole, you can, you can uh, starve your black hole, and then the accretion disk will, get, will bloat, and will get thicker and thicker and thicker. We believe that this is the, 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 the general configuration of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, an underfed, starved, almost starved black hole, but not completely starved. On the opposite end, what happens if you try to overfeed a black hole? What happens if now you want to feed your black hole, you, you bring your black hole on a date to a Brazilian churrascaria, okay, and it eats a lot? And it eats so much that it, it eats uh, rest mass energy above the Eddington limit, okay? What happens in this case, okay? The thing is, this is possible because we derive the Eddington luminosity limit for a spherically symmetric accretion. But in reality, it will have violations to the spherically symmetric accretion. And so accretion above the Eddington limit, it is indeed possible. And this is the least well understood solution to the black hole accretion disks. We call, so in this case, what happens is that the disk is, has a very high density, so it, ha, it is basically opaque to photons, so photons will diffuse inside the gas and take a very long time to leave the gas. Right? So the, the photon diffusion time scale is now larger than the accretion time scale. So now radiation pressure will inflate your accretion disk like a balloon, not thermal pressure, radiation pressure. And now we will have what we call the super Eddington accretion disks, which we understand very little, both from the analytical point of view and from the point of view of general relativistic MHD radiation numerical simulations. And this is what happens with the radiative efficiency. Remember the radiative efficiency that we, me we mentioned already during the lectures? This is the power output of your accretion disk. It is related to the, ma to the rest mass energy of your field supply to your black hole. And this is the radiative efficiency of your accretion disk. This is what we think happens with the radiative efficiency as a function of, the, of this ratio, m dot over m dot Eddington. So the highest efficiency is achieved for thin accretion disks. For super Eddington disks, they don't like to radiate, so the efficiency, we believe, it's very low. And for starved black holes, the efficiency is also very, very low, basically due to the relation between the microphysics of electron heating and the density of the gas. So now we have a unified theory of black hole accretion disks. The next question is where, if you are designing an astronomical mission, where in the electromagnetic spectrum would you try to search for the signatures of the presence of these accretion disks around black holes in the universe? Then now we, may, we must understand how matter couples with radiation in these uh, gases flowing and spiraling towards black holes. And so here is a picture of some of the important processes of the electromagnetic interactions uh, with matter in accretion disks. So first, usually we have very strong magnetic fields in accretion disks, and we have uh, lots of free electrons, and these electrons are moving around these magnetic field lines. So you have, this is the Larmor radius of the electron moving in the magnetic field. And you have these accelerated electrons spiraling in magnetic field lines. And so you'll have what we call the characteristic synchrotron radiation from these accel this char accelerated charges in moving in spirals in the, uh, following the Larmor radii. 
So we expect to see synchrotron radiation. We expect also something called Compton scattering, which is electrons are colliding with photons. You have in the accretion disk a rich gas of particles with a rest, ma with a rest mass which is not zero, and you have a relativistic gas of radiation with a rest mass of zero. So the photon field will interact with the electron field, if you wish, and they will scatter each other. Depending on who gets the MR energy, you call it Compton scattering or Compton scattering. The other process is that electrons will interact via, uh, through Coulomb collisions with protons, and they will be accelerated. They are lighter than protons. They will be bent. Their, their paths will be bent and they will emit radiation. This is what we call Brennstrahlung. And finally, this is important for, so these three processes here, they release what we call continuum emission, because if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum and you work out the equations, it's a very smooth, broad spectrum characteristic of these interactions, okay? This, this by itself is a whole course on radiati, radiati, radiation theory, okay? It's a what, six, six months course that we teach to our graduate students in, in our astronomy institute. There is a further process which is important, which is ionization. In other words, if you throw a charged particle into an atom or you throw a high energy photon towards an atom, you can, re, you can remove electrons from the atom, okay? So this is ionization, of course. The thing is when the electron recombines with the nucleus, you will have emission lines released because of this recombination. I will talk a bit, a little bit more about emission lines. Because this is a theoretical physics institute, I, I am obliged, contractually obliged, to show Feynman diagrams. So these are the Feynman diagrams of the electromagnetic interactions. The, this is the synchrotron uh, Feynman diagram. This is the inverse Compton Feynman, Feynman diagra diagram. If you, if you wish, time is horizontal and space is vertical here. This is the Feynman diagram for the brent strahlen interaction. And finally, well, I will not show a Feynman diagram here, but I just wanted to say the line emission is important because you have ionized gas, which re the, the nuclei recombine with electrons. As, as the electrons recombine with the nucleus, they, they, they like to go back to the ground state. And as they transition down, uh, down to lower energy levels, they release emission lines, which are really, uh, um, uh, they are really you know, telling us that these gases, they obey the quantum mechanics, okay, quantum transitions. So let's begin talking about the continuum processes. Let's look at the, the thin disk solution with a very high accretion rate. So this thin, this thin accretion disks, they have a very high uh, densities. The gas is basically opaque. So in other words, the, the photons will, will have a lot, a lot of time to interact with the, with the protons, sorry, with the electrons in the gas, and they will essentially reach an equilibrium where, where the photons and the electrons will be described by the same statistical distributions with the same temperatures, okay? So when you have uh, the photon field in equilibrium with the electron field, you have black body radiation, where both are described by the same temperature. So at each radius of this accretion disk, it is locally emitting with the Planckian spectrum, the black body. So if there are thin disks in nature, we expect them to have, we expect to look with a telescope to a black hole. We will not see Hawking radiation, okay? Sorry if you are excited about Hawking radiation, but we will not see Hawking radiation. We will probably not see extra crazy dimensions, okay? We will see the four dimensions of space-time. Uh, something re emitting in four dimensions, okay? And we will expect to see something that emits like a black body. The black body radiation comes from the gas around the black hole. This is the characteristic spectrum of black body radiation. So it has this characteristic shape uh, as Planck taught us, uh, and other people taught, uh, taught us over the last century. It has this characteristic shape. This is the frequency of radiation. This is the intensity of radiation in logarithmic scale. And it has this shape of a peak. And the peak drifts towards higher energies as you increase the effective temperature of your gas. Okay, in this case, 
uh, yeah, this is the basic picture of a black body radiation. So if you work out with the equations for the black body physics, it will find out that the maximum temperature of the black body is inversely proportional to the mass, the, cent the mass of the central object. So for thin accretion disks around supermassive black holes, black holes with masses of millions or more than millions of solar masses collapsed inside the event horizon, we, we expect the temperature of the gas to be, the maximum temperature, to be around 10, 100,000 Kelvin. So due to the physics of black body radiation, we expect the peak of the electromagnetic emission to be in the ultraviolet. So if you want to see the signature of the presence of supermassive black holes, you want to design a telescope sensitive in the optical to, get, to catch the lower end of the black body emission and ultraviolet. On the other hand, if you have stellar mass black holes with masses of 10 solar masses comparable to, to the 10 solar masses, the temperature will be uh, uh, almost 1 billion degrees, and you expect the peak of emission to be in X-rays. So you need X-ray telescopes. This is a, a simple calculation I did with the physics of black body, showing you the spectrum, logarith logarithm of frequency in Hertz versus logarithm of luminosity for the typical black hole in the center of a galaxy with a lot of gas being provided to the black hole, and it peaks in the ultraviolet, okay? So you, if you are close to this accretion disk, you will get a lot of sunburns, okay? You will get probably skin cancer if you go close to this black hole. It peaks in the ultraviolet. The other, the, the other main solution that I discussed uh, in this course, I have really to take care of the time here. I didn't, what, what, ta what time am I, am I supposed to finish my lecture? Are you guys keeping, I was not really paying attention. Starts at 2.30, it should end at around 3.15. No, sorry, three, four, around 4, 3.45, 4. Okay, 3.45, 4. Let me put a timer here. Very good. So the second time of black hole disk solution that, I, that we discussed is the so-called RIAF, relatively inefficient accretion flows. So the RIAF, it inflates like a balloon vertically because of the high thermal pressure, because it doesn't like to radiate the heat generated locally as radiation, so it inflates like a balloon, a heated balloon. So RIAF, because they have low densities, they are what we call in astronomy optical in. In other words, they are transparent to most radiation. So if there is a photon generated inside the heart of the RIAF, but if a photon is generated around here, it will easily scan the system because it doesn't really interact with the gas. That's what we call optically thin in astronomy. And because uh, another interesting thing is that graphs, they get extremely hot. They get extremely hot. And by hot, I mean they develop what we call two temperature plasmas, where there is a stratification of the temperature of uh, protons and electrons. The electrons, they reach temperatures going up to almost one trillion Kelvin. This is a huge temperature, uh, close to what we call the virial temperature of the of this system. So, a couple of interesting processes, uh, radi radiation processes, start getting important in a RIAF at such high temperatures and at low densities. The first radiation process is that we expect reasonably strong magnetic fields, turbulent magnetic fields. So we expect reasonable amounts of uh, synchrotron and Brenstralon radiation. Synchrotron because of the magnetic fields, Brenstralon because protons and the electrons. 
And we also expect the photons to interact with the electrons in the disk. So we, we expect not normal Compton scattering, but the inverse Compton scattering, where the relativistic electrons will actually give energy to the photons. Usually in laboratories here on Earth, we see normal Compton scattering. But in this plasma, there, the, uh, there is inverse Compton scattering. Oh, and also we expect there are some traces of a thin disk outside the RIAF, but this is one of the weak, this is one of the puzzles in accretion disk theory to understand this transition, this border of the RIAF. We don't have really a theory for this dramatic thermodynamic transition between the two solutions. It's one of the outstanding problems in accretion disk theory. So the, the spectrum that you expect from a RIAF is way more complicated than the spectrum from a thin accretion disk. This uh, x-axis is the log logarithm of the electromagnetic frequency. Here is the, the, the luminosity. And you, see, you expect to see a way more complicated spectrum with a synchrotron peak in the radio, an inverse Compton peak in the x-rays, and further uh, peaks of the inverse Compton emission which are related to the electron Lorentz, the microphysical Lorentz factor of your electrons, and also the, ra the energy density in your radiation field. This is the, the how you can work out this expression by working out the, the, the theory of ra the radiation theory here. I computed this spectrum from a model that my, uh, my group has. Uh, we know how to connect the gravity, gravity with the plasma around the, accre the, the accretion disk. And so we can more or less easily, if you have questions, you, you can ask my student, Ivan, who is sitting there. He's an expert in computing this kinds of uh, spectrum. And he can describe you the paper he published a couple of months ago where he played. I hope he had fun playing with these models. Did you have fun, Ivan? <laughs> OK. Right. Uh, there is literally decades of work behind the work, um, the decades of work behind this plot that I'm showing you here. So I am, I am simplifying this in an incredible way, okay? There are a lot of math, a lot of physics behind what I'm showing you, but my time is limited, so I have to move on. And now let's talk about not continuum electro radiation, but uh, del direct delta kind of electromagnetic radiation in the form of emission lines due to quantum electron quantum transitions, the uh, energy transitions. So the disks around the black holes, they can also produce these emission lines because the heat energy can ionize the atoms. Then you have free electrons, and then the free electrons, they, they can recombine with the nuclei. And then by, as I mentioned, by going back to the ground level state, every time the electron goes down an energy level, it releases an emission line. And so you expect to see emission lines being released by the surface of accretion disks due to these transitions, this kind of trans transitions of uh, ele electron energy transitions. And the emission lines, which if, if there was no motion in the gas and there was no turbulence, the emission lines would be direct deltas, precisely located at the energy of the electron energy transition. However, we don't have stationary gas. We have a relativistic gas. And so we hope that by looking at these emission lines, we can learn something about the way nature likes to feed astrophysical black holes. So the idea here to the, behind the physics of emission lines is somewhat simple. The idea, imagine that you have moving clouds, which are each little moving cloud is emitting some spectral line. Imagine there are electrons in, one, in each of these clouds going down from the level three to the level two, let's say. In, uh, imagine this is hydrogen, only hydrogen. And imagine now that in the moving frame, you will see a direct delta located at the, at the energy of the transition. The problem is, imagine you have clouds which are moving around the central object. And what you are detecting, you are not resolving the motion usually of individual clouds. You are detecting all the emission lines together, unresolved from a single point, And you get a collective measured line from the entire system. And what you would expect from the 
line is not a direct delta, you would expect something much more, com a little bit more complicated than a direct delta. You expect the integrated emission line spectrum to have a contribution of the clouds receding from you. So they are uh, red shifted, so they have lower energies. This is Doppler shifting. Uh, this is the physics of the Doppler effect applied to the motion, the effect of the motion of the clouds on the emission lines. And the parts, the clouds which are approaching towards the observer, they increase the energy, they are blue shifted. And so you expect to see an emission line in a very simple case, something like this. So the Doppler broadening of the line is entirely due to the motion of the gas clouds. So we expect this, so, okay, so the, 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 the width of the line, the, if you measure the width of the line in the frequency space, you expect the width of the line to be much larger than the, the individual clouds, okay? It's not a direct delta. And, the, and you hope, as an astrophysicist, that the shape of the line might inform you about the velocity field of the gas and the shape of the gas in homogeneities of the gas and perhaps tell you something indirectly about the space-time of the black hole by looking at the emission line. So uh, astronomers have been playing this game for quite some time now. So if you play this game and you model the, you model the velocity field of the accretion disk, which is recombining and producing an emission line, and you couple the Kerr metric. This is what you expect from the iron K alpha transition. Okay, this is not now a hydrogen. This is iron. There are, this, is our, this is the emission line of electrons decaying, going down the energy levels in an iron uh, atom. So this is the model that you expect for the emission line distorted by the, gra by the gravitational redshift, the usual Doppler shifting, around a non-spinning black hole. Remember, this is the ESCO. This is the innermost stable circular orbit around a Schwarzschild black hole located at 6M. This is the, as I, the, as I mentioned in my second lecture, the ESCO. And also, as, as uh, Ian mentioned in his lecture, the ESCO for a Schwarzschild black, black hole is 6M. And for a curved black hole, it can go down, if you have a maximally spinning black hole, it can go down by a factor of six. So if you do the calculations, you plug in the space-time, you plug in the physics of the gas and the physics of the emission line. Here is the ESCO, now you have a maximally spinning, black, uh, almost maximally spinning black hole. And look at the dramatic distortion on, of the, on the ge null geodesics of the light that is trying to escape from the accretion disk. You see a dramatic difference in the brightness. This, uh, you see that the lower energy side of the line extends way down because of gravitational redshift. The line is also less luminous also because of gravitational redshift. So you expect, this is amazing, you expect to use electromagnetic observations to probe the spin of the black hole with emission lines. So the, this became really an industry in the late 90s and the 2000s, and still the industry is going down. But it became an industry of trying to constrain the distributions of spins of the curve metric of astrophysical black holes by looking, at the, uh, looking in x-rays to several systems. Uh, I played a bit of the game myself, but I played in lower energies. So this is a work that we, this was actually, in fact, my first, the, the, the work related to this was actually my first paper ever. So we, we took not x-ray observations, but we took optical observations of the center of a galaxy. This galaxy is called NGC 1097. I remember the phone number of the galaxy. So we put what we call a long slit along, uh, along the nucleus of the galaxy to try to see if we could actually see the emission lines from the effect of the central black hole. And the emission lines we got here, they were not in x-rays. Actually, the, cent the lab frame emission line is what we call hydrogen alpha transition. And look at the sort of beautiful emission lines we saw with an optical telescope. We saw lines which, have, which are very, uh, in my opinion, strange. They have this what we call double-picked emission. Forget about this uh, 
thing, this, this, this del direct deltas in the middle, they are not related to the accretion disk of the black hole. And this kind of double peak shape is precisely what we expect when you have an accretion disk circling around a supermassive black hole with a velocity field with typical velocities going up to 10,000 kilometers per second. And we were able to model this emission line and constrain the geometry of the accretion disk around the black hole. So we constrained that the, the, the radia, radius of the accretion disk is above 200 m. So it's a weak field regime of gravity. OK, so we, we are not able to constrain black hole spin with this kind of observations because it's uh, happening almost in the weak field limit. However, in the 90s, there was a breakthrough called the, uh, the uh, I think it's ASCA telescope in the 90s. So they looked at another energy transition in the iron K alpha, and they also saw something that looked like uh, the sort of shapes of lines that we I presented before. Look at this line and this line. Okay, these are this is a model, and look at the observation in X-rays. This is fantastic. So the, the, the typical velocities here from the Doppler shifting now is relativistic. It's, it goes close to 100,000 kilometers per second, so one third of the speed of light. And now you are getting very close to the black hole at radii close to the innermost stable circular orbit. And then things start getting even more fun. So this was a breakthrough because it was the first that, uh, direct signature in emission lines of relativistic phenomena in black holes. And the mass of this black hole is around uh, 10 to the 7 solar masses in the center of a galaxy with the name of M6. Six, I can make up a number here. It's a, it has a strange name, this galaxy. This is the nature paper of, that, of this breakthrough observation. OK, so this is the basic picture of where you want to look at in the electromagnetic spectrum if you want to ob observe the astrophysical footsteps of black holes. For thin disks, you, ex you, you should look in infrared, between infrared to x-rays. Most if you have a supermassive black hole, if you have a stellar mass black hole, then X-ray emission. If you want to see the star of black holes, you want to, well, then you have a broad spectrum between radio to gamma rays, but you have to be very careful about modeling these observations. It's not easy to reduce the observations and make it clean enough to leave only the physics of the black hole in the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? When you do astronomy, Electromagnetic astronomy, you have to worry about things, boring things like dust emission from the galaxy, stellar emission. I don't care about stars. Most of my colleagues in, my, in the astronomy department about stars, but stars contaminate a lot of the spectra, so we have to remove the stars because I care about the black hole and the black hole physics. And now we are reaching what I call final frontier. It's really not a final, but uh, you know, it's the beginning of a new era in black hole astro the electromagnetic astronomy of black holes, where we are hoping to have a direct imaging of the accretion disk for the first time in history, and even perhaps constrain the shadow of the event horizon itself. The goal of this final frontier of direct imaging of uh, disks around black holes is this. Okay, this is what we want to achieve. We want to have a nice, clean image of the disk around the heart of darkness and directly make models you solving the Einstein's Einstein Well, for the Kerr metric here, we don't expect anything crazy, so it's just the Kerr metric. And we want to compare directly our models with the observations and constrain the spin of the bottom. The thermodynamic properties of the gas, what happens under the extreme curvature conditions to matter near event horizons. This is the ultimate test of Einstein's gravity. So uh, I will not really have time to talk about this unless I volunteer, if you guys are interested, there is, I know that there is a hands-on session this afternoon. So I volunteer if there is enough interest to give you a short presentation about the Event Horizon Telescope. If you are interested, so we can discuss 
questions, we can discuss if you want to have some time, if we want to hear about the Event Horizon Telescope. After I finish my talk, okay, so I will not really able, be able to tell you much now. I have a whole, I gave a colloquium about this, so I have a lot of stuff to show you. But the idea is you model the, the null geodesics, got, tracing the geodesics from the accretion disk, and you trace the shadow of the black hole. You make this kind of model. This, is a, this model is very simple. Okay, we have way more advanced models nowadays that I, I describe in my colloquium. And the idea is by looking at the size, literally the size of a black hole in your image, you can constrain black hole physics and black hole spin. So now let's move on to outflows. Now we talked about the ins of black holes. Let's talk now about the outs of black holes. Any question about accretion disks? Any question about the ins of black holes before I move on to the outs? Mm -hmm. And about the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we, uh, he mentioned that you have to take into account the escape from the gravitational potential, yes. So your question? Yeah, so the, the, that's the idea, to, to build a spectrum. To build a spectrum, the, the idea, the conceptual idea is simple. You put a black hole you put the gas distribution around your black hole. In this case, I will just put a blue ray of gas. So you have to generate your photons. So the idea here is that you use the, thermo the physics of the gas to understand what is the energy of the photon that is being launched at each radius of the accretion disk. So you model this with the wave, the wave four vector. And the wave four vector, it, it, it tells you, the, the zero component tells you the energy of the photon, okay? And the, the spatial components tell you about the wave vector itself, okay? So the wave vector, the, traditionally in Newtonian physics, the wave vector is pointing at the direction of propagation of the photon. And it's normalized such that the, 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 the modulus of the wave vector is really the frequency of your uh, the frequency of your radio of your photon. Okay, so the idea here is I can talk more about this in the Event Horizon Telescope talk if you are interested. But the idea is you generate the initial conditions for the, all the wave the fo the wave four vectors being released. By disk, and then you have to propagate these wave vectors in the space-time of the black hole until they reach a virtual observer in your model, okay? And if you collect enough wave vectors, you expect to sample in an appropriate, in a complete way, the picture of the black hole. And then you, you expect to compare this cumulative distribution of wave vectors with our ideas about the black hole spin, the mass of the black hole, the velocity field of the black hole, okay? So it's an indirect way of using the radiation field to probe the parameters of the space-time, okay? And, of course, the way you propagate this is with the geodesic equation, the geodesic equation for, for no uh, wall lines. There, there are models. Uh, there, you can do a first model of the system as if it was in thermodynamic equilibrium, but we have strong reasons to believe that parts of the system are out of equilibrium, and the physics is way more complicated. You cannot simply model everything with a black body. It's more complicated than that. Okay, we call that non-thermal radiation. Okay. So now I will, I will proceed and talk about the outs of black holes. Yeah. 
if your black hole is at a redshift bigger than 0.1 or 0.1 or bigger than that, yes. You can use your favorite cosmo I mean, the, there is no, the favorite cosmology is what we observe, the lambda CDM. So then you use the lambda CDM and then you correct the effect of cosmological expansion of the universe on the light, on the light of that we you receive. Okay. Uh, so let's now talk about the outs of black holes, outflows, flows that are flowing out of the system, therefore outflows. So this is a beautiful observation of something that is flowing out of the center of a distant galaxy. We call it radio galaxy, Hercules A. Look at the tiny size of the elliptical galaxy compared to the extent of the outflows coming from the center of the galaxy. This is not a model. This is a radio observation with the very large array in New Mexico. This is another beautiful observation of uh, some, uh, a plasma beam being produced by the center of another radio galaxy called 3C31. And here, look at the tiny size of the galaxy, the collective emission of all stars in the galaxy, which was artificially colored as blue here. And look at how far the beam of plasma shoots out of the center of the galaxy, okay? It goes up to almost five times the size of the, the size that you get from observing baryons in your galaxy. And look at this other image. You have now a radio galaxy with a phone number, a snapshot address of M87. This is a particularly relevant target for astrophysicists, where again, you, there is something at the center of the galaxy shooting some, uh, a very straight ray. We call these rays relativistic jets of particles. And this is reason to believe that there is something at the dynamical center of galaxies, of many galaxies, which are literally cosmic particle accelerators. So there is something which was mysterious, but not mysterious anymore, that is shooting particles at the center of mass of a galaxy. And when you go down and you use some simple arguments to try to estimate the powers that are being carried in radiation, in kinetic energy, in momentum of these outflows, you, you derive powers, energies which are so big that if you were able to spread the power, the energy of this jet across all gas in the galaxy, you could gravitationally unbind the galaxy, okay? This is the kind of energetics we are talking about when we talk about these jets. So they carry enormous amounts of energy, number one. And number two, when you time particles take to cool down as they flow away from the center of the galaxy, you can have an idea of the age of this, these jets. And you understand, you, we realize that the age, the, 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 these jets, sometimes they are millions of years old. So there is something retaining the ori orientation of the rays over millions of years. And this is not easy unless you have a very powerful gyroscope to keep a line and powering this beam of particles over millions of years. So in the early uh, 70s, uh, the, 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 the relativists, I don't know how to, say, to pronounce this word, but, but GR people, including Roy Kerr and other people which are now very famous, decided to sit together with the astronomers and astrophysicists to discuss what could be powering these very strong rays coming from the centers of galaxies. And they quickly realized that these jets, the most likely origin of the jets is a black hole. More, uh, you know, m more specifically, a Kerr black hole. This was a conjecture. It still is a conjecture because we don't have a proof that these spinning black holes, they are powering these uh, relativistic jets. But the, 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 the appealing things for a theorist is that a spinning black hole has a lot of free energy in the rotating space-time that can be extracted by Penrose-like mechanisms. And number two, curved black holes, they are very stable gyroscopes. So the only one of the ways you can misalign the gyroscope in a curved black hole is if you throw another spinning black hole in a collision with this curved black hole. But this is, doesn't happen very often. 
in, astrophys in, 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 in astrophysics, okay? So from the very beginning, it was conjectured that spinning black holes could be in these gigantic, beautiful relativistic jets. And there is growing evidence, uh, growing empirical evidence that this is in fact correct. There is no proof, but there is a growing body of evidence. Theory and simulation seems to agree that there is a paradigm of uh, spinning black holes powering relativistic jets, but the observational picture, as usual, is way more messy and nonlinear, almost similar to biology, where you start building separate pictures until somebody figures out that DNA unifies everything. We are missing the DNA in astrophysics right now. Uh, so how can we extract energy from the black hole to power these very intense beams in relativistic jets? So Penrose in the late 60s proposed something called the Penrose process of extracting the free energy, the rotational free energy of the Kerr black hole with, uh, through exploring, exploiting the frame dragging around the spinning black hole. So this is a very interesting paper in the 1960 or 1969 by Penrose. But it was quickly realized that the Penrose process is, doesn't seem to be really applicable to astrophysics because you need to basically throw a projectile and destroy the projectile in the ergosphere and make part of the projectile leave the ergosphere of the black hole and reach an observer. You have to fine tune the orbits of your project projectile. So it doesn't seem to be really easy to get energy with pen the, the original Penrose process proposed in the 60s. But there is a modified, updated, turbo version of the Penrose process which seems to be relevant in astrophysics that I will mention now. You, uh, using now magnetized accretion disks as agents for the Penrose process. The, but, but the thing, the bottom line so far of this uh, of this presentation is that you need something that happens naturally. Okay, you 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 you, you cannot use some convoluted theoretical scenario because you see jets everywhere in the universe. So this process that is powering jets must be something that you get reasonably easily from the evolution of galaxies and their central black holes. So you need something that you can, you, not so convoluted. Nature must be able to actually execute this process to energy from your black hole. So what is the mechanism powering relativistic jets in the so after decades of work and more specifically numerical uh, numerical simulations of uh, evolving Maxwell's equations in the curved space time of curved black holes, we now have a very nice picture for how to get a cosmic particle accelerator with a curved black hole. So the idea is the following. The idea is... Uh, the, the basic ingredients for an astrophysical jet is you need a large scale, a large scale magnetic field, magnetic field line. You need to bring this large scale magnetic field line close to the event, into the event horizon, and you need rotation. Okay, so these are the three basic ingredients. The projector is nervous uh, to learn about the physics of uh, jet production. It's trembling. So these are the three basic ingredients, magnetic field, accretion disk, and rotation. Large uh, field, because this will be the agent of extracting, this will be the agent of the Penrose process in astrophysics. Accretion to bring the field into the ergosphere, and rotation, because we want to extract the rotation of the space-time. So what I will show you now is a nice, clean numerical experiment published in a science paper uh, 14 years ago by a Russian physicist, Semenov. I don't know his first name. And what you will see here is a curved black hole. In gray, you see the null surface of the, the horizon of the black hole. This is the ergosphere where you cannot have static observers. The, the strong frame dragging is happening inside the ergosphere. And the blue line is a magnetic flux tube which will be moving and will be accreted towards the black hole. Look at the fascinating physics that will happen now as we play and solve the Maxwell's equation in the curved space-time. So there is gas that is bringing the magnetic field into the horizon. Okay, the magnetic field swirls around the spinning horizon. 
Uh, and what happens here, look at the number of loops that you have of uh, azimuthal polar uh, loops around the horizon, okay? The frame dragging is making the field bend and create essentially a twisted tower of magnetic fields circling the, or, or the horizon. As you can see, the angular momentum of the black hole is in this direction I'm showing with my laser pointer. And what happens here is that as the, aura, the, the frame dragging twists the magnetic field around the black hole, the pressure associated with it, the azimuthal component of the, black, the, of the magnetic field is growing. You are increasing the magnetic field, you are increasing the pressure, the magnetic pressure associated with the azimuthal, the phi component of the field. And if you study MH, if you study electrodynamics, you know that one of the features of the dynamics of a, of a magnetic field line is that few lines of the same polarity, they don't like to be close to each other. They want to get farther away from each other. If you try to bring them close together, they're like, oh, I don't like you. You have the same polarity as I have. I don't like you. Go away. So this is what's happening here. You are increasing the pressure here. What do you expect to happen? You expect them to be thrown away because they don't like, they have the same polarity, they don't like each other. And this is indeed what happens next. The built-up the built uh, phi pressure, the phi component pressure of the field creates a twisted tower of magnetic fields that will bring together with this extraction any charged particle that is forced to move along the magnetic field. This is the mechanism for producing a jet. Very easy, no extra dimensions, no charged black holes, no fancy things, no Penrose process. In, this isn't a, a more likely version of the Penrose process. You just need B, accretion and rotation, and you get a cosmic particle accelerator. This mechanism is nowadays called in astrophysics Blandford's Nagic process. Uh, in honor of Roger Blanford, who is now the director of uh, astrophysics in Stanford. And this guy, Romans, now physics and became the mayor of some small town in England. But they published in 1977 a seminal paper where they solved a perturbative version of Maxwell's equations in a slowly spinning curve. Uh, slowly spinning black hole, and they demonstrated that the jet power you get out of this cosmic, literally cosmic battery, is proportional to the magnetic flux that you bring close to the horizon times the rotation frequency of the horizon to the square power. You can demonstrate this with the. You can demonstrate this in different ways. This expression. It could even be a homework to to you guys. Uh, and then you put in the physics of the Kerr metric to demonstrate that the spin, the jet power depends on the square, the square of the spin. So the larger the spin of the black hole, the more power you get out of it. The larger the magnetic flux, the more power you get out of it. And you can relate finally this with the accretion rate onto the black hole. So this is the Blandford's Nagic process in astrophysics, is an actual working version of the Penrose process through magnetic fields. There are, of course, complications to the simple picture. Well, it's, it's reasonably simple. The, the, the simple picture of the Blandford's Nagic process. Environment is a complication. Radiation is a complication. GR, the full nonlinear theory, is complicated. And also, Lance theory precession complicates things. But let's forget about these details. We, we will not care about them right now. The important thing right now is that you can build a black hole battery at home, if you want. Okay, and then you can sign your how do you call it? Testamento, testament. Is it how you call it when you when you the wheel? Good, thank you. You sign your wheel, and then you build a black hole battery in your backyard. This is how you build a black hole battery in your backyard. And this is how you, you, you want to make a black hole jet at home. The physics of the black hole jet production, the physics of the Blandford's Nagic process is the same, basically the same physics as what we call an homopolar generator. The idea here is, this is, a, this is, I, this is an idea I took from Alice Harding and NASA Goddard. You take a magnet. Oops. You take a magnet, and then you put it in a spinning wheel, and then you put a, a measure the voltage between the center and the border of the magnet, 
And as you start spinning your magnet, you start getting a voltage, a, a, a current out of this device. Okay, this is a generator. Now, replace this, replace this spinning thing by a rotating black hole. Replace the magnet by the magnetic field lines. The, magnet, the magnetic field lines are the wires in the circuit. And you have a normal polar generator in the Blandford's magic process. Okay, physics is basically, is essentially the same. Um, okay, so this is how you build a black hole jet at home. Try it and have fun. So, uh, the, how do you get a jet in practice? Okay, so you need to bring in magnetic field to the spinning black hole. How do you do it? So you build an accretion disk around the, 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 the central black hole and you, pro, and you puncture this accretion disk with an inner magnetic field. And as it accretes, it will bring the magnetic field in the black hole and produce the, the, the ray, the relativistic jet. So you need a compact object accreting high magnetized gas to produce a, a relativistic jet. And such conditions, they are very easily found in black holes at the centers of galaxies, also black holes in binary systems, where one binary system, the, the primary component is a compact black hole, it's a black hole, and the less massive component is a star. So you have this binary system, and the black hole is taking gas from the star, powering itself and powering a jet. So let's go now and talk about the basic facts of about jets produced by black holes. So each of these basic facts they came they came from observations, okay? Number one, black hole jets they are they are highly magnetized. And one way of uh, uh, quantifying this magnetization is, is with the plasma beta parameter, the ratio of the gas pressure to the magnetic pressure. So usually the, uh, the magnetic energy density is much higher than the gas density, uh, energy density in relativistic jets. Because these guys are highly magnetized, you expect that there are lots of electrons flowing in Larmor radii in the magnetic fields. So you expect very strong synchrotron radiation from relativistic jets. And if you compute the theory of radiation to compute the peak frequency synchrotron emission, you will find out, as you find out in a six months radiation course in, a, in our institute, that this depends basically on the square of the microphysical Lorentz factor of the electrons and the strength of the magnetic field in Gauss. If you put these values here, it, this is the peak frequency in megahertz. So synchrotron radiation is expected to peak in radio. So if you want to look at cosmic particle accelerators, you want to start looking in the radio wave band of electromagnetic spectrum. Second fun fact or the second basic fact about uh, jets. They are relativistic. We know for a fact that they're both Lorentz factor, the, macro, the, the, the mac, uh, macroscopic bo uh, Lorentz factor of these flows. They are between a few, like five, up to sometimes 100, and sometimes there are, there are some gamma ray bursts where they estimated Lorentz factor of 1,000. Okay, so the velocities of particles in the jet, they are easily above 90% of the speed of light. So interesting things start happening due, based, due to special relativity when you have a relativistic plasma producing radiation. Let's imagine that the moving frame of the plasma, the radiation has this sort of picture. You have an electron. You have a blob of gas, okay, you have a blob of gas emitting radiation in the co-moving frame. It looks like an this isotropic radiation. The same amount of radiation is being, is being released everywhere. And this is the, pointing, uh, the different pointing flux vectors here. Uh, this is in the co-moving frame. If you are an observer, what, what will you actually see in the observer's frame? In the observer frame, due to the relativistic aberration effect, you will see that the direction of the radiation for you observing this guy moving and producing radiation, the radiation will be 
increasingly beam towards the direction of propagation of the blobs in the jet. Okay, so it will be increasingly focused in the direction of propagation, and this is purely a relative, spatial relativistic effect. Okay, that you, with some effort you can estimate these angles and this beaming angle with spatial relativity. The bottom line here is that because they are relativistic, they are beamed, so most of the radiated power is in the direction of propagation of the jet. If you are misaligned with the jet, you will lose the bulk of power of the relativistic jet because of the special relativistic effect. And finally, we know from observation, this is, a, this is a, a trivial consequence of special relativity. Forget about this side of the slide, the, the, the lower right side of the slide. And also we know that they are uh, highly collimated, these, uh, these jets. Okay, so if we have ways of estimating the collimation angle, and we know that they are usually highly collimated. So these are the defining properties of observed jets from black holes in the universe. So where in the universe do we observe jets? I, show you, I showed you a couple of examples associated with the centers of galaxies that we call radio galaxies. But where else in the universe do we find jets? So whenever there is accretion and hopefully spinning black holes, we, found, we find jets. So the, I will mention in my lecture tomorrow about the phenomenology of uh, black holes. Uh, the so-called active galactic nuclei, they, we observe beautiful jets being produced by the central black holes in galaxies. We also observe these jets in binary systems in our galaxy called black hole binaries and something called microquasar because it's a micro version of the quasars in the centers of galaxies. We observe jets. We typically observe a few uh, examples of jets from newborn black holes in gamma ray bursts every day. This is actually a sky, a celestial, a, a sky map of uh, gamma ray bursts, where where you have the stars dying or collapsing or coll collapsing or coalescing, and you produce these jets. Uh, young stellar objects, uh, you also see jets. Here you don't have a black hole. You have a spinning central star. So you don't necessarily need an event horizon to produce a jet, okay? But with curved black holes, you maximize the power and the speed of the jet. If you have a star, it will also have, an, you have something, a nonpolar generator. And finally, what we call tidal disruption events, where an unlucky star is tidally disrupted by, the, by a supermassive black hole, feeds the black hole. If it's spinning, you get a jet out of it, and we observe this kind of tidal disruption events. And to finish my lecture now, and I will continue tomorrow, I just wanted to point out that there is a very strong relationship between jets and gravitational with a new era of multi-messenger astronomy. Because the only data point we have right now, the, the merger of the neutron stars that happened later on uh, last year, we observed a nice jet, and we also observed gravitational waves. So this, is, this was the beginning of the era of multi-messenger astronomy. Perhaps now we will also catch jets and, gamma, and, and gravitational waves from other kinds of gamma ray bursts. And I will talk about gamma ray bursts tomorrow. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So the uh, questions from the second part of the lecture, yes? If the will the magnetic field cross the event horizon? Well, my the way I view this is that you can treat the event horizon. You can write a formulation of the equations of Maxwell equations and GR, and you can treat the black hole as a conducting membrane. Okay, this is what we they call membrane paradigm. So for all effects, you can treat the magnetic field as threading the black hole but not puncturing it. As a, as a spinning membrane which conducts electricity. 
So it's see, that's what, what motivates me to talk about homopolar generators, because you can treat the black hole as a conducting spinning sphere. So I don't see the, the, the field penetrating the horizon, but maybe you have other, maybe you guys have other things to add about the, the magnetic field and the horizon. You can treat it as it, it, it not going inside, but threading the horizon as a conducting membrane, what we call membrane paradigm. Okay, so what comes next? Let me look at the schedule here. Now we have a coffee break until 4.15, and then we have the hands-on session. And I don't know, would you be, I, I don't care, I don't, if you want to see about the Event Horizon Telescope, I can talk about 20 minutes. Low. Lower. Okay. So How about you? So I think one one possibility would be to to um, counter this effect and and give them a a presentation of the Event Horizon Telescope on Friday afternoon, where the energy is a bit low and that may create an enthusiasm for the weekend somehow. Oh, sure. yeah, I because because I think having uh, having discussion or Hands-on is probably going to be a bit yeah. viscous, okay. but... Okay. So see you at 4.15.